Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation. I was really happy when I received the invitation because I said, oh, good timing to speak about that project. So, but uh, it, it's like one year after, and now we're just, oh, we were kind of enthusiastic. There were stuff we thought that would be done that were still, still from never result. But I think we have enough to, uh, to show you uh, a lot of things we've done in this project. And uh, this project, uh, it's kind of a project that started, uh, we had kind of a, um, a working meeting, a workshop, and in this, in this, in this uh, workshop, we had nice ideas and then uh, say, oh, that's really an important question. And then when we get back in the office, we just ask, okay, there's no way we can get funding for this project. And there's so much log logistical constraint to it. We're just kind of, okay. And then instead of saying, okay, just forget it, we just thought, why not trying to do it as a collaborative science experience? So that's, that's, that's the way this project started. And that's why today I thought that would be interesting to, that to speak about the results, but also about the process we made, because I think that's, I don't know, I, I had fun and I found that was a cool way to do, to do work. So, so that's what we'll present. So the question was about, uh, uh, yeah, we were looking for the above and below ground intraspecific trait variation for understory, uh, understory spe species that grows in the North American uh, forest in Canada. So yeah, so that's the idea came for this workshop where we were working of, on trying to find some uh, just kind of conceptually have an idea of what are the key traits for modeling vegetation response to climate change. And then we identify some gap of knowledge. One, one of it was the, uh, we don't have information about North American ubiquitous understory species. Uh, these plants are, they have really broad range. Uh, they are found everywhere in a wide variety of, uh, of environment. And, uh, and just by their, bi their, bi their biomass, they play an important role in ecosystem function. But there's very few studies on those species because uh, traditionally we study more species in, in the, for the understory species, more the invasive one or the species that were rare. But all those species that we see everywhere, we kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of everywhere. So they were not that much study. And we, in this workshop, we really thought that was, this was a missing piece to predict the impact of global change on ecosystem processes. So that was one suggest, subject that had been identified. And then, yeah, these species, as I told you, they are wide geographic range. Some have more than, f they spend more than 5,000 uh, 5, kilometer uh, distance. Uh, to, uh, so this is from here to, I can go back to, uh, to Montreal from here. <laughs> so just to give you an idea of the distance that they can cover. Uh, and they have a so wide ecological breadth. They can be found in really poor uh, bug type forest to uh, maple rich forest. And some are growing in really low diversity ecosystem like the boreal forest. So this is kind of have a hint that it could be uh, intraspecific variability will, is likely to be very important. And most of those species have also low dispersal ability. So being in such a wide uh, range, they, there's really candidate for local adaptation and genetic drift. So we thought, hmm, that's interesting. So we say, okay, we are interested to work on this question of intraspecific variability as one of the important uh, factor to predict species persistence in a changing environment. One important key aspect of uh, adapt, uh, 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 species adaptive capacity. Yeah, and Canada, if you look at it, it's kind of a, a really nice uh, experimental settings where you have a, a, a gradient of precipitation from the east to west, and you have also this, uh, this uh, north to south uh, gradient as well for temperature. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then that's just kind of another aspect why we thought would be interesting to work on that. It's a gap of knowledge also. Uh, we don't know much about those species, but also we don't know how the, their, their, their traits vary across their range. And this is makes several logistical problems. Let's say we use data, uh, data from a, 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 a trade database. Uh, it's hard to know where our data we're, we're using are, are located within the range of the species. Are we uh, collecting those, the, those species more in the, the low uh, value of the, of the species or are we really close to the mean? We don't know. So we're kind of blind when we use data from, when, when we use data from a trade database, when you don't know where they have been collected and you don't know where they are located within the, the, the range of, uh, of, of, the, of the trade value that the species can have. And also, uh, we had one practical question also. We don't know about geographic, the, the variability within the geographic. And this is one problem I was personally having in my lab, where we were trying to mapping uh, vulnerability to drought. 
and we were using uh, to uh, document sensitivity, we were using traits. So we were using, we had to use average of, of species, the few, in, the few data we could find. And with those data, you know, we're just thinking of traits that are related to drought and we are within a gradient of uh, precipitation. So there's already adaptation of those species we can think of through, throughout their, their range. And we didn't have this geographic intraspecific variability to add into the, into the mapping. So we had to use average and knowing that was a big limitation of our work. So yeah, and the last question also, it was another knowledge gap that had been identified that the root trade data availability, very scarce. And also uh, the question we have here, I will not spend too much time on, on that, but just the question is there's the same story between the root and shoot traits. So there were some evidence in the literature, some not, so we were, we were interested to that question. So then, okay, so how do we can address this question of intraspecific trade variability across a continental scale? We say, would be great to, uh, in a perfect world, we can do a systematic uh, trait screening, but you know, I don't see how I can, I can send 20 to 30 teams across Canada and they had to also to collect the leaf at the same time, you know, because you want to, because some traits are changing so much within the, the season. So f yeah, just remember, we have 5,000 kilometers if we think of some geographic. So we say, mm, that's not possible. But then so let's, why, let's see with collaborative science with some uh, our network of, uh, of people we, we work with. Uh, uh, this network was started with the, th the topic network, which is a, a regional trade database we have in Canada. We're used already to work together. So we tried, we sent an invitation and we had a really good response. And when I say we all the time, it's important to say this is work I'm co-leading with Alison Munson. So it's really uh, the two of us that started this project. And then we had the uh, Bride Kermudzi that work it was a fantastic postdoc. He just finished uh, recently with us. But uh, so that, the we is the, is the three of us. So, um, so then we had a good response. We had 23, 23 teams across Canada that accepted to work with us. And it was a, a nice transdisciplinary team from uh, ecophysiologists, community ecologists, but also what I want to, to say, community, community uh, uh, gen geneticists, uh, ecology geneticists as well that joined the team. So that we were really happy because we can bring all this ecophysiology, community ecology, but uh, genet genetics into the same project. So we chose six species that had a large uh, distribution in range that was found throughout Canada. And then the, we, uh, with the team, there were 81 sites that have been chosen. So how it works is that people were uh, collecting uh, the, 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 the information we were needing it within their existing sites, but using a protocol that we were sending. So they have, uh, we have 81 sites that, have loca that are located in 33 uh, uh, lo locality across Canada. And we use a hierarchical sampling for that. So we have, uh, in total, we have, a we speak about population. We cannot go at the individual because it's all clonal species. So we didn't want to get into that, that trouble. So we see population, <laughs> we work at the population uh, level. And then we have side that are some disturbed, some undisturbed because we wanted to have this breadth of variability. Um, and we had, so they were located, as I said, in 33 locality from Yukon to uh, Newfoundland. And we measured traits, leaf traits and root traits that were analogous and also genetic markers for two species, uh, for vaccinium and for Cornus canadensis. And then we had also um, so a biotic and abiotic variable that were measured by the team in the, in the, in the field. And also we, we add to that large scale climatic variables. So sp speaking a bit about the process we've done, so that was really uh, important to say that these team were collecting new data using their existing field sites. So we had to make a protocol that was, and we had people from various also disciplines. So we had to make participation as easy as possible, but ensure that we have data of quality. So that was a really, uh, we could not send them with 50 page of protocols, you know, no, no one will have read it and we will have received worse worse quality in data. So we really had to find the, the fine line between that. But in the same time, we wanted to work in trust specific variability. So we need to have standardized protocol and field form. And so we created also how to videos, how to collect roots. <laughs> so they're really videos. They can see how, what exactly we were speaking about fine roots. And, but they were sending not only the fine roots, the, the, the full root system. Maybe one thing to say for people studying roots, 
understory species in North American forest is the, the easiest one. I, it's a, maybe I should have kept it as a secret. <laughs> but it's, it's really, it, it, most of the species are in the organic layers and they are really superficially rooted. And um, so really, really easy to dig. You just remove a bit of the organic layers and, and then you, you can find the roots really well. So it's, it's a charm, I have to say. So. <laughs> so it was not that bad because I'm speaking with people in other uh, systems. I'm just kind of, oh, we were lucky. So yeah, so then we had videos how to do that. And then we also important, we streamlined the sample flow because that was really a, an important thing just to tell you we had fresh samples. Eh? Uh, all the roots needed to be sent fresh. So we give them a pre-addressed package. They have to, with ice pack and everything, they just need to freeze it and, uh, and, and uh, send it that way. And we had to process that really fast. Eh? So we organized uh, a streamlining of, so if you have roots of that species, you send it that place because we didn't want also to add variability from different labs doing the work. So that was a kind of a, <laughs> <laughs> good uh, coordination work. Uh, so we have also standardized lab protocols and a lot of discussion, good trainings with the technician and coordinator. We had uh, constant uh, meetings with between the, the two labs who were doing the, the root uh, fresh samples uh, analysis. And then we had all these dried samples and data sets and hundreds of pictures and all that. So this again was needing lab, lab coordination with all standardized and centralized sampling and a good, a good process. We had also importantly, we at the beginning of the project before we get taken any data, we have a good data management plan with an online data entry platform. So people, the 23 teams can enter their, the data they collect in the, in the field, the, the one that they were just about the, the environment. And they had also video on how to enter the data into the <laughs> into the, the 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 database because we didn't want uh, creativity in the way you enter the data. We want that they enter exactly what we think we want there. And also, so centralized data with database with a web access, but also with different level of access. So we don't have anyone that just say, oh, I will delete data or anything. So it was the, was the, yeah, well, I think well, well taught. And a lot of communication, different level of uh, communication, phone meeting, workshop, and so on. Okay, so yeah, now <laughs> research. So how, how we've done that? So what was the research question from this practical question we had and more and uh, all this uh, cons logistical constraint? So we can get now to the research question. So we had two big broad uh, type of question. First, we wanted to, answer, to understand a bit more how the intraspecific trade variability is structured with, for the, so we were looking first simply to document the breadth of the variability across the species distribution for our six species. And then we, we look at the variance partitioning across the scales we had, and then we look up to the root and shoot synchroniz synchronization. So that was the three main question for that, for the structuration of the intraspecific variability. And then we were interesting, what are the main drivers of this variation? So we look for environmental variables, but also for genetic variation. So just rapidly, just to show, um, and, and a lot of things I will show, I feel like we have chat about that in the two days, which is kind of some, some example or empirical evidence of stuff we have seen during the, 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 the two past days. But just to say that in the breadth of, uh, of the intraspecific trade variability, for SLA, we really have a nice, uh, nice uh, origination of the species between conservative and acquisitive, but we just don't see, it was far more messy for root traits, eh? we don't have this kind of nice, uh, 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 yeah, ordination of the species. Uh, yeah, just rapidly, uh, and yeah, we'll find time, <laughs> hopefully, to discuss a bit more. So how are the intraspecific trait variability was structured? We had a lot of difference between species, and they were not really a uh, good uh, coordination uh, that we could find easily. Uh, yeah, I didn't want to spend too much time on that kind of fuzzy graph. I just thought I will make a more condensed information. So just here for the fraction of the total variance that is explained by uh, each of the scales. So you have uh, the, the, side, the side scale where we were working about a, a 50 meter uh, distance between the, the samples, a locality about 10 kilometers approximately between the samples and biophysical region could, could go up to 5,000 kilometers of distance. Uh, and then what we can see is that a lot of, pro of the proportion of the, the, uh, the, of the variance is explained by local site 
uh, so site and locality. So that's, uh, that was a question we, we found interesting to, to document because uh, it showcased that for even for those species that are so broadly distributed, they, if you do uh, your study in a local site, site but this includes disturbed and non-disturbed, uh, it's important to say we have disturbed and non-disturbed sites, so some various uh, level of light, so we have some variation within the, 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 the locality. But this is giving, um, you, you are capturing a, a large breadth of the variability you have. So, so that's interesting for, for a lot of when we use trade data uh, from a local site and we try to, to expand it to a different region. It gives kind of a good, good sol solid uh, evidence for it. And then between the, it was, we had the same type of, in, of, uh, of level for the leaf nitrogen of uh, the variance that was explained. Uh, again, a lot of local uh, site. And we were asking for root and shoot synchronization. So what we can see is that, no, and I, I, don't, I don't show you all the different uh, nutrient content that we, we look, but yeah, we, didn't, we could not find any synchronized variability uh, be, between above and below ground traits. Uh, for nutrient content, that was the one that was the more, uh, I would say, uh, constant uh, across leaf and root, but for uh, the other elements, they were varying like the specific root land here. So, yeah, so a lot of variation. Yeah, okay. Okay, and about the main drivers. So uh, this here, we just, we're working into that right now. So just to say, um, between we look for soil variables and climate variables. So, and the soil variable uh, measured at the site was the one that got, uh, that was the, the most important explaining the, vari the variability that we, we observed. Uh, and especially for the, the root traits, the root, uh, leaf traits was more related to the climate, but the soil variable, uh, the, the root traits were more related to soil variables. So this is really, uh, this is really accordance with the result we had for the intraspecific trait variability structure. So it's really, um, it's at the site scale that we, we are uh, taking most of this um, variance and it's related to those, uh, mo mostly to that, the soil uh, variables. And then, yeah, I wanted to sp spend time for this where we had the more surprise with the genetic variability. This is work uh, done by Julie Godbout and Nathalie Isabelle. Uh, so just to remind you, we asked people, this is, we've done, we only have result now for Vaccinium angustifolium, which is a blueberry. Uh, and then, so we, people were sent, it, it's all, um, people were sent to collect Vaccinium angustifolium based on morphological uh, tricks we have to identify. It's, and it had been done by field ecologists of experience because that was the first thing <laughs> we, were, uh, we were looking at. And then what you have, maybe I can explain a bit of what you see here in this graph. So the one that are in, in beige, that, uh, it's vaccinium angustifolium that are pure. So here you see every, uh, every, uh, every site you got there. And then what you can see is that uh, we have uh, in, in green, it's hybrids that we have between uh, what is blue, it's vaccinium myrtioides, which is another species of vaccinium. And then the other, the yellow, um, red and uh, mauve, <laughs> uh, pinkish color is uh, some, um, they have a, uh, they, it's, it's vaccinium angustifolium, but that have a specific signature for the, they have kind of probably a genetic drift or local adaptation that's happening there. So what, what happened when we received these, result, these results here? So we, first we thought some people are not good to identify vaccinium angustifolium, which is kind of such an easy thing, you know, even my daughter, when she was five, she could, she could do the difference, you know? <laughs> so we were kind of, oh, and then mm, that's where, and especially they're pretty, especially bad, you know, up, uh, up north, you see the blue and green. So we were pointing there, but finally this is two teams and this is, there's a, a tax, uh, there, in one of the team, there's someone who is a taxonomist that was there. So then, oh, it, what makes a big uh, shock. And, uh, but then what's happening is that we, with, and we've done other analysis also, we've done some barcoding analysis to verify those results and all that. And the surprise was that there really, the morphological identification in, in some case doesn't match with the genetic identification. So what means is that, for instance, one of the main uh, morphological uh, traits that we're looking about to identify vaccinium angustifolium and myrtioridas is that angustifolium have no hairs and myrtioridas is really hairy. So we just, that's an easy one. But just to say that uh, there's other, <coughs> other aspects we're looking, but that's one of the main. So 
what's interesting is that where you have this blue and green, uh, <laughs> it's called Bekomo, this area. It's the area where we have the wetter environment. It's really, it's really wet and it's really uh, north. Eh? So uh, they have less hair. So you have Myrtioides or hybrid with Myrtioides that have no hair out there. So it kind of looks like local adaptation of the of the uh, of uh, some population out there. And there's also maybe some hybrids of of uh, second and third generation that are hidden with it, with the, the vaccinum angustifolium that we can see here. So yeah. So then we were kind of. That's why also it takes a bit longer because we had we've done many uh, other analysis just to make sure we of the result we have here so that was one big surprise so then uh, we are now looking at any links between the genetic variation and trade variation but uh, before the summer we're doing more samples because we want also to see what's happening in in more in the in the east coast just to make sure we can also see because we have also some interesting signature uh, we can see in uh, newfoundland and also close to the great lakes and we want to understand a bit more the, the story that is there but uh, this is really it was a big uh, a big question, and then from there we can ask, okay, so what's so what do we do in interest specific trade variation when we have hybrids? Eh? That's a question I would like to have your your view on that because uh, I was speaking with the with uh, Natalie and Julie, and they were saying, you know, there's plenty of species that are breeding, are breeding, you know, there's, it's it's a lot, you know, so so it's dangerous to work with these people because uh, <laughs> they don't work with the same reality than you. So and another question we were looking here that we can answer with these, these analysis, it's about the clonality. So yeah. it's the next step we're looking. We have a nice variation in, in clonality here. I'm just showing locality, but we have more information at the site level. And what we're interested here is to see if there's any links between the level of clonality and the trade variation. So that would be an interesting question as well to answer some. So more to come soon, hopefully. Okay, so to conclude, some lessons we learned along the way with this project. Colored science was a fun way to, to do the work. I think one, one aspect just takes more time. It takes more time to settle things, takes more time to work on the different aspect. But, but I think it's really, it's really I'm, uh, I'm really happy of it because I think it's really a way to accelerate advance on questions that we just cannot do from just one lab. And that also we cannot do using data that have been already collected. So I think that was an interesting way to really have an objective-based collaborative project in this way, because you can have more precise, you know, more tailored data that you need for your project. Uh, and then this kind of, trend of uh, collaborative science approach really help us to do some trans transdisciplinarity was really that because the genetic uh, protocols were really was really embedded into the uh, uh, community and ecophysiology protocols. So that was really, uh, I think, one strength of the project. And also it helps do large scale <laughs> screening. That was totally impossible for us to do. And also with modest funding, eh, we started with a really modest funding and just from the collaborative field work, we doubled the, the, the within kind that was, we doubled the, the, the amount that was put in the project. And then from there, we could level double the project. And uh, so just to say that it's really can be a really good way to, to fund the project that that's hard to fund. And also to do fastidious sampling like crude traits, eh? because uh, there's a lot of data we just don't have because they're too hard to get. And I think because of that, we just don't, it's oriented a lot the research we're doing. And we work with what's easy to, to have in hand. So sometimes we may just try to find other way to document this harder stuff and then we can, it gives significant advance hopefully. And this project, I would say, brings uh, more questions and some practical and some philosophical and, and a mix of it. A uh, few questions that just came from, yeah, I just rapidly wrote that yesterday because also from the, the, the two days meet, meeting was interesting to say. We spoke a lot about fast and slow species, but I would say what about adaptable species that would be probably the winner in the future with the changing climate, eh? So with it, it, I, intraspecific trade variation would be one dimension. We should, we should look, okay, there are species that grow, that are fast acquisitive, slow acquisitive, but other that can, that can go from one to the other depending on the condition in which they are growing. And that might be a, a really important aspect. And if you think on their story species in North America, they are species that are 
uh, really uh, flexible in this sense because they grow, they can grow in different habitat, but also they can, they are used kind of a sit and wait strategy. So they will be in a shaded environment and oops, there will be an opening and then they will, they will grow and they will take advantage of it. And then they, 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 they never, they are never in the competition to get up, eh? They're just in the competition to persist. So that's, that's interesting. And, I, and hybridation, hybridation might be also an important aspect that we just, you don't know about it that is important in this kind of uh, adaptive capacity. And uh, also, yeah, another question. So we're working in the shade there and most of the protocol we have to measure traits are uh, for sun, for, uh, for uh, in sunny conditions. So I really enjoyed the poster of Trevor, I don't know where is that, uh, on, on that question. I found that was uh, for uh, the uh, leaf, leaf traits in, in the shade. That's really a question we had and we had this problem for, uh, so I, I'm wondering if we need a new uh, a kind of new or revised uh, protocols adapted for intraspecific trait variability because if we always measured also only in the, sh the, the sun, we don't have this in the breadth of this intraspecific variability. We cannot, uh, we don't have uh, all, all the, the breadth of the species is able to, 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 to grow in. So that's, that's question and, and us sometimes we just cannot uh, be in the sun because the species is growing there. We can find a crappy specimen in the sun, but that's not, it's a species growing in the shade. So that, that's all, all thing we need. And also it brings back also to the question uh, of uh, the ecological scales that Julie, Julie was bringing in her paper, because if we want to look in specific trade variability, then we, we should have this variability at, different, at, at this different ecological scale and it's include shade versus light. And the last question that I would really like to know, I don't want to have question, I want you to tell me what we should do with these hybrids, eh? Uh, what do we do with hybrids in a trait-based ecology? We know we're based on species and it just brings us so much in the face that species, it's such a concept. And it's, uh, in reality, we work with a complex of, uh, uh, of a continuum, you know, from, and that's part of why life, is, you know, it's, it's evolving, you know, so it's, uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, and especially when we're measuring intraspecific trade variability, you know, intraspecific, but we're not working with species. So that's, uh, we had kind of, yeah, that's a question we'll have to deal with uh, in the future paper we're currently writing. So, yeah, I want to, thanks, uh, yeah, there were the, the we had the de dedicated coordinators that makes uh, such, that's so important in collaborative work to get these people and this financial support and all the participants. Thank you.